Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm not sure which one this is, but about a year or so ago, we started with these series of uh, aftershocks, which we named really to discuss uh, you know, the, the idea that people can't all go to the different uh, societies. I'm an interventional cardiologist. I go to interventional cardiology meetings at ACC, but I don't go to HFSA. I don't go to HRS. And the truth is, some of these big trials that come out there, we never get to hear uh, from the proverbial horse's mouth with these, with these um, sessions. And so what we decided to do is after the major conferences, take the, the big trial that came out, uh, repackage it, have the original author present it, and have one of our local esteemed experts from New York uh, act as the moderator um, who has a topic of interest in the same topic. And so today we're gonna talk about uh, the clear outcomes trial that was presented at ACC. And I'm here as the president of the New York ACC to introduce the whole concept and welcome everybody to the programming, and then I'll let um, Dr. Vaidula is going to introduce our moderator. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this New York ACC event. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator tonight, Eugenia Gianos. Eugenia is a professor of cardiology at the Zucker School of Medicine. She's also the system director for cardiovascular prevention at Northwell Health and the director of the Western region of the CAPS Institute of the Women's Heart Program, and also the director of the Women's Heart Program at Lenox Hill Hospital. So Dr. Giannos is very busy. Um, <laughs> and thank you so much for making time for us tonight. Um, Dr. Giannos, please um, go ahead and um, introduce our speaker tonight. Wonderful. So first, uh, before getting to our um, very, very um, well-known speaker. I just want to thank uh, the two of you, uh, Dr. Vudula and, and uh, Dr. Nidu, for the wonderful work you've done on our New York uh, State chapter. I mean, the number of things that have been accomplished in the past couple of years as you guys are completing your reign is, is astounding, and including this incredible uh, program, Aftershocks, a very clever name. I love it. Um, so now we get to um, the man we've been waiting for, uh, Dr. Steve Nissen. Um, so Dr. Nissen is Chief Academic Officer for the Heart and Vascular Institute at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, the Lewis and Patricia Dickey Chair in Cardiovascular Medicine and Professor of Medicine at Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine at Case Western Reserve University. So from 2006 to 2019, he served as the Chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine at Cleveland Clinic. And from 20, 2006 to 2007 was our ACC uh, president. Um, in recent years, we all know him mostly through his being a study chairman for multiple large global cardiovascular outcomes trials, mostly in the field of lipidology. Um, his contributions to the scientific literature include about 600 plus journal articles, 60 book chapters, um, he works very closely with industry on developing new therapies, but is very specific about having a policy to not uh, to actually donate all the related honoraria directly to charity uh, that he receives. Neither uh, he neither receives income nor a tax deductible, not, nor a tax deduction. Important for you know his uh, lectures on this. Um, and in two thousand and seven, he was named Time Magazine's one of um, their world's 100 most influential people. Uh, in 2015, he was also named a Thomas Reuters, uh, by Thomas Reuters as one of the world's most highly cited physician scientists. Um, so um, this is a, a very big honor that we get to hear uh, from Dr. Murphy on this important trial. And please put your questions into the chat. Um, we would like to have this be a very interactive session. So we're excited to hear about the CLEAR Outcomes trial, Dr. Nissen. Well, thank you so much for that very gracious uh, introduction. And thanks for having me. Uh, you know, I have a lot of history and a lot of respect for the New York chapter at the ACC, which as you know, is the founding chapter of the ACC going back a very, very long, long time. So I wanna talk about statin intolerance. I'm gonna give a little bit of background information before we dive into what we found with the CLEAR Outcomes trial. For all of you who see these patients, you know that this is a very vexing and elusive clinical problem that troubles many of us on a day-to-day -day basis. So the question is, how common is statin intolerance? You know, the data isn't as good as we would like, but uh, this PRIMO study, which was published a number of years ago, is about a, a typical of what we see. 
And overall, there were 10.5% of patients that really had very well-documented statin intolerance. Interestingly enough, it does vary by type of statin. It has always been the worst with simvastatin, maybe the best with fluvastatin and in between with other statins, but clearly it's a problem that is very well documented in the literature. Now, um, the time of onset from starting a statin is generally early, but not always. So, you know, one to three months after starting therapy is when you see it. Median time of symptom onset was only one month. So clearly people who have been on statins for a long time, unless something's changed, are likely to truly have statin associated myalgias. The Kaiser database published showed that anywhere from about five to 10% of patients develop statin associated myalgia. Uh, this is a pretty good size study, over 30,000 patients. Again, observational. Uh, it was only lovastatin and simvastatin at the time. Um, a smaller fraction had documented myositis, that's CK elevation of one to threefold. Uh, another, you know, less than half a percent had severe CK elevation in the four to 10 times the upper limit of normal. And then a much smaller fraction had true rhabdomyolysis. So clearly there's a gradation of statin intolerance. When we see these patients, it's important to keep in mind the patterns that are strongly associated with true statin intolerance. It's usually pain or weakness in large symmetric proximal muscle groups, worse with exercise, generally resolves within two weeks of discontinuation of the statin. The symptoms return when rechallenged within about two weeks. They may have hyporeflexia that's mild, but they have normal pain, vibration, and position sense. And uh, laboratory studies are generally completely normal. Risk factors include older age, women, and that's gonna come up a little bit later. There's certainly a genetic factor. We can, we're not gonna talk about that today, but we know a lot about it. Uh, certainly pharmacodynamics, it's dose related. It can be, it's generally multi-system disease. Transplant patients get it. Uh, perioperative patients may get it. P patients with obstructive liver disease are at higher risk. A big one is hypothyroidism. Most common thing I see in the clinic is somebody comes in, we, we, ch we check their thyroid first thing off and they're profoundly hypothyroid. We correct their hypothyroidism and they tolerate the statins. Renal failure and extreme exercise. Extreme athletes tend to have statin intolerance. Now we studied this about you know seven years ago in a trial known as Gauss-3. We published this in JAMA. Uh, this was a 500 patient study we did funded by Amgen. And what we did was we did a crossover study. We gave people blinded placebo or atorvastatin. They didn't know and their physicians didn't know which they were getting. Then we crossed them over so the placebo patients got atorvastatin and the atorvastatin patients got placebo. And we then classified these patients as to whether or not they had symptoms just on atorvastatin, just on placebo, on both, or on neither. And the results, I think, are fairly illuminating. 42% of patients had symptoms only on atorvastatin, but not on placebo. However, 26.5% of patients had symptoms only on placebo, but not on atorvastatin. 10% had symptoms on both, 17% on neither. And so what it shows here is about twice as many patients had intolerable muscle symptoms that on the statin that were not, uh, not on placebo. And so to me, this confirmed what we had believed for a long time, that statin intolerance is in fact a real phenomenon. With that background, we conducted the CLEAR Outcomes trial. And I will show you a little bit about 
what we did and what we found. This was sponsored by Asperian Therapeutics that make this drug that we studied, bempedoic acid. And I wanna thank uh, the investigators. We had 1,000, over 1,000 investigative sites and patients that were just marvelous. I mean, they really were dedicated as I will show you at staying in the study. The study was conducted by C5 Research, which is the academic coordinating center here at the Cleveland Clinic that I now look after. Uh, we had a very good executive committee. Uh, you'll recognize some many of these names. Uh, I chaired the executive committee, but we had two very good principal investigators, Mike Linkoff and Steve Nichols, and then an international executive committee of people who are very thoughtful and very knowledgeable about uh, this disorder. And then a fabulous study team behind us at C5 Research and really great uh, people to collaborate with at Asperian. So these are the slides I showed to the ACC. And I, well, if I, I'm at risk of repeating myself, I will say again that statin intolerance is a vexing problem that actually prevents many patients from achieving LDL levels associated with cardiovascular benefits. And we have very good data that patients that are intolerant of statins have a worse cardiovascular outcome. Very important principle. Bepidoic acid, drug that was approved in 2020, is an ATP citrate lyase inhibitor. It inhibits hepatic cholesterol synthesis upstream of HMD-CoA reductase, the enzyme inhibited by statins. So it's the same pathway, but it is upstream. Very importantly, it's a prodrug. It's activated in the liver, but not in peripheral tissues. And that results in a low incidence of muscle-related adverse effects. And we, we knew that going into this trial. It was approved in the year 2020 for lowering LDL, but its effects on cardiovascular outcomes had not been assessed. And it was not used commonly, in part because in the contemporary era, both physicians and payers expect outcome data before they're going to use a drug widely. So here's just a schematic of, of how it all works. It, this is actually from the editorial in the New England Journal. And you see in the skeletal muscle, bempedoic acid is inactive. There is no enzyme in skeletal muscle that will convert it into the active moiety. And so uh, that means that the effects seen in peripheral muscle cells that include glucose intolerance and myopathy don't occur. In the hepatocyte, there is an en enzyme that converts bempedoic acid to its active moiety, where here, upstream of HMG-CoA reductase inhibitor, it's inhibiting ATP citrate lyase and leading to the same deprivation of uh, cholesterol in the hepatocyte that results in LDL up receptor upregulation and reduction in uh, LDL. It also means that it has the same anti-inflammatory effects of statins because it's actually acting in the same pathway in the hepatocyte. So here is what we did. Statin intolerance was defined as an adverse effect that started or increased during statin therapy and resolved or improved after the therapy was discontinued. We required intolerance to two or more statins, and the vast majority of people had intolerance to at least two statins, or one statin if unwilling to attempt a second statin or advised by a physician not to attempt a second statin. And this is typically people that had pretty severe myositis or even rhabdomyolysis, or whose symptoms were so severe, they said, I don't wanna do this again. They were allowed on very low doses of statins that is below the lowest approved dose, such as 10 milligrams of atorvastatin two days a week. So anything below the lowest approved dose was allowed. Importantly, we enrolled both primary and secondary prevention patients, but they had to have an LDL of greater than 100. They were randomized one-to-one, -one to bempedoic acid, 180 milligrams a day, or a matching placebo. 
Like all contemporary outcome trials, it was event-driven. We required 1,620 primary four-component MACE events, but we also required at least 810 three-component MACE events uh, so that we would have power to ask the question, and I'll show you those endpoints in a minute, uh, of both four-component and three-component MACE. And we required at least 24 months of follow-up. We did not want to make the mistake that was made with the PCSK9 inhibitor trials, where they went too short and got suboptimal results. Now, for there to be, for this trial to be appropriate, ethical, uh, and one that we were willing to do, we required the following statement from patients. Patients had to state in writing signed statement. I cannot tolerate these medications called statins, even though I know they would reduce my risk of a heart attack or stroke or death. And my doctors also explained to me that even though I may not tolerate a statin, I may be able to tolerate a different statin or a different dose. Everybody had to sign the statement and the providers had to sign a statement in my opinion, this patient is unable to tolerate a statin, except possibly at very low average daily doses based upon my review. And so this was required right up front by every single patient. Now, um, as also is now contemporary, uh, we had a hierarchical testing procedure. This is done to preserve study-wise alpha at O5. So you first test the primary endpoint for component MACE, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, coronary vascularization, or cardiovascular death. If you're successful, then you test the next in the hierarchy, which is three component MACE, no revascularization included. If that's successful, you go on to fatal and non-fatal MI, then coronary vascularization, then fatal and non-fatal stroke, and cardiovascular death, and then all-cause mortality. Now, this is a little bit like playing scientific Russian roulette, because if you get the order wrong and you fail anywhere along this pathway, you have to stop reporting p-values. You have to stop testing for significance once you reach a non-statistically significant effect. So getting the order right here is obviously an important exercise. We randomized 13,970 patients at 1,250 sites in 32 countries. This was a very challenging trial. We enrolled patients beginning in December 2016 through 2019 in August with a median duration of follow-up of 40.6 months. I am very proud of our team that despite the pandemic, we had complete assessment for the primary endpoint in 95.3% of patients and vital status in 99.4% of patients. And I will tell you, we had to scramble to allow the trial to be completed under the worst conditions I've seen, certainly in my clinical trial lifetime. We actually got Four component MACE in 1,746 patients, we needed 1620, and three component MACE, we needed 810, and we got 1,238. So we had plenty of statistical power. Now, who were these people? Uh, their mean age was about uh, 65. I have to tell you something happened to me. It only happened, it's happened to me once before with a late breaking trial when I reported that to the ACC audience, and we, by the way, had a really great ACC. We had four or 5,000 people at the, in the main auditorium for this initial presentation. When I told them that we had 48% females, the audience broke out into a spontaneous applause, something I'm very proud of the fact that it was a, it was a study that looks like the population that we treat. Uh, LDL cholesterol was elevated, as you might expect, in a statin intolerant group, 139, CRP 2.3. We had 30% high risk primary prevention, 45% diabetic, and 
uh, baseline statin use that is very low dose statin and a little less than a quarter of the patients. So what did their trial regimens do? Well, we specified in the statistical analysis plan to test LDL reduction at six months when adherence was high and when there was little chance of crossover. And we got a 21.7% reduction at six months. This was about what this drug has achieved in the trials that led to approval. You will notice a gradual convergence in the LDL curves. And that relates to there being a drop-in to additional lipid-lowering therapy in the placebo arm. Even though we specified people were not to look at lipids, you know that people probably did. And they could figure out to some extent that somebody was not getting a reduction in LDL. And they added other, other therapies, including, as I will show you, PCSK9 inhibitors. We got very robust anti-inflammatory effects. And it's one of the properties of the drug that we're going to be exploring as a mediator of benefit. We got a 22% reduction in HSCRP at six months that was pretty well maintained through the course of the trial. So what happened to the primary and secondary endpoints? So let's go in hierarchical order. The four-component MACE endpoint hazard ratio 0.87 p-value of 004, a 1.6% absolute risk reduction, and a number needed to treat of 63 over 41 months. Interestingly, the harder endpoint, three-component MACE, had a hazard ratio of 0.85, and the p-value was also very strong, 006. Um, and clearly, that's highly significant. And we are therefore able to move on to the next endpoint in the hierarchy. And next up on the left is fatal and non-fatal MI. And here, the treatment effect was large. The hazard ratio was 0.77. The p-value was 002. It's a 23% reduction. You'll notice that after about six or eight months, the Kaplan-Meier curves begin to separate and they progressively separate through the rest of the, the treatment period. Similarly, we got a pretty good treatment effect on coronary vascularization. Hazard ratio was 0.81. The p-value was 001. And again, within about, with certainly within a year, you see separation in the Kaplan-Meier curves that progressively increases over time, which is what we like to see. It means that it is in fact, uh, you know, uh, a, the proportional hazards model here is maintained. So now we've had four of the components. We, we were still significant, so we get to keep on testing. And so we next test fatal and non-fatal stroke. And here the number of events was smaller, even though the hazard ratio was 0.85, the upper confidence interval was 1.07, and we are not showing a p-value because of the rules we set in place at the beginning. We have to stop computing p-values when we get the first non-significant result in the hierarchy. Hospitalization for unstable angina, quite surprisingly, had a hazard ratio of 0.66 with quite wide separation and quite prompt separation in the Kaplan-Meier curves and the upper confidence interval is 0.86, but we're not showing a p-value because of the rules that we set in place at the beginning of the trial. There was no effect of the regimen on cardiovascular death or all-cause mortality. We were not surprised. You will recall that neither PCSK9 inhibitor had an effect on cardiovascular death. Uh, they had almost exactly the same hazard ratios we show here. We have become very good at keeping myocardial infarction patients alive, and that's a good thing. And, you know, death is now a much later indicator uh, in effective therapies for patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And our concomitant medications are so much better. You know, dual antiplatelet therapy, all the things, better antihypertensive therapy, and all the things you do every day. And so 
you know, it's very, very hard in the contemporary era to see a death benefit here from an LDL lowering therapy. We just haven't seen it in recent years. Now, uh, everybody wants to know, was this along the lines that was predicted by the cholesterol treatment trialist collaborative? We, and many of you have read these manuscripts. They're very well done by the Oxford group. And basically we saw for the endpoint used in CTTC 0.85, that was our endpoint. If you make all the calculations based upon the LDL reduction we received, which was 0.67 millimoles per liter or 26.1 milligrams per deciliter, we would have expected a hazard ratio of 0.846. <laughs> it doesn't get any, any closer than that. And so, in fact, this was along the lines of what would be predicted based upon other LDL lowering therapies. Now, what we did see, and I think we would have probably seen even better hazard ratios, we see an excess of lipid modulating therapy cross-ins in the placebo group, 15.6 versus 9.4%, including every class, including azetamide, including PCSK9 monoclonal antibodies, uh, including some statin use, including uh, you know niacin and PCSK9. Basically, there was more drop-in in the placebo group, which caused the LDL differences to converge which undermine to some extent our ability to test the effect of bempedoic acid as a therapy rather than a strategy. And this just shows you the time to cross into additional lipid modulating therapy. We do our best. We try to maintain a blind. We tell the investigators, you know, that they shouldn't be checking lipids and doing these things, but they do them anyway. And you can see the effect here. This is the time since randomization to cross in, and it's obviously higher in placebo than pempidoic acid. Now, what about adverse effects? Everybody in every trial needs to be keenly aware of these. Muscle disorders were completely balanced, as were withdrawals from muscle disorders. Placebo and pempidoic acid were no different. Adverse events leading to drug discontinuation, the same. Um, serious events, the same. New NSA diabetes, one very important aspect here as shown in that New England Journal of Medicine graphic is vampidoic acid does not increase blood sugar. And so it is different from the statins and it relates to where it works and how it works. If anything, it was numerically a little bit less. Like all lipid lowering therapies, we see some elevation of hepatic enzymes that are of no consequence. Uh, this drug, vampidoic acid, reduces renal tubular excretion of creatinine and uric acid. So the redu reduced excretion of creatinine leads to a, a effect of more renal events, but they're not really renal events. It's actually a biochemical phenomenon, not a real phenomenon. Gout was about 1% higher because of the increased uric acid levels. And we did not expect it, but we did see a 1% increase in uh, cholithiasis. Uh, that was the first time that had been seen with this class of drugs. We didn't think either, any, either of these were uh, negative enough to counterbalance the morbidity of benefits that we saw with the therapy. Now, there has been some pushback from some sources, I won't name who, uh, who've said, oh, statins don't work very well in women and all of that. Well, that's not what we saw. Women had exactly the same point estimate for the hazard ratio as men, 0.86 versus 0.87. Both genders did equally well. Very important that we make note of that. Limitations. We only studied statin intolerant patients. We don't know what the effect is in populations that were not studied and other populations were not studied. 
This addition of other therapies, including PCSK9 inhibitors, narrow the LDL difference between bempedoic acid and placebo over time, which does, to some extent, uh, reduce the favorable effects of bempedoic acid. And then we had enormous challenges from the pandemic. And I'm really pleased that we got full outcome data in 95.3% of patients and vital status in 99.4% of the patients. When I shared these data with the FDA, which I did before we presented them, FDA was really complimentary about the fact that we kept this trial's scientific integrity high despite the challenges. So what were our conclusions? Well, the drug was well tolerated in a mixed population of primary and secondary prevention patients, unable or unwilling to take statins. It lowered LDL by 21.7% and CRP by 22.2%, with small increases in the incidence of gout and cholelithiasis. Primary endpoint, four-component MACE was reduced 13%, three-component 15%, myocardial infarction 23%, and coronary revascularization by 19%. We felt that these findings do establish pempidoic acid as an effective approach to reduce major cardiovascular events in statin intolerant patients. Now, I just want to put this into context, and this is a little bit provocative, but what we did was I just put together this table. So I didn't show this in the main presentation, but just to show you for non-fatal MI and three-component MACE. As many of you know, the azetamibe trial improved it, underperformed. The hazard ratio was 0.9, and non-fatal MI was 0.87. The PCSK9 inhibitor evolocumab was 0.8, and non-fatal MI was 0.73. Alarocumab, PCSK9 inhibitor, was 0.86 for three-component MACE, and 0.86 for non-fatal MI. And bembidoic acid was 0.85 for three-component MACE and 0.73 for non-fatal MI. In my view, you can add bembidoic acid to the therapeutic armamentarium and it lines up pretty well with the other non-statin therapies that are available for treating patients. The manuscript is available. And by the way, it's available at no charge. The New England Journal is putting this online. There's a QR code here, and anybody who wants to, even if you don't subscribe, can, can read it and certainly encourage you to do so. So I always end these talks with a final thought, and I will tell you what my final thought to the audience was, that management of patients unable or unwilling to take statins represents a challenging and frustrating clinical issue. Regardless whether this problem represents a nocebo effect or actual intolerance, these high-risk patients need effective alternative therapies. The Clear Outcomes trial provides a sound rationale for use of bembidoic acid to reduce major adverse cardiovascular outcomes in patients intolerant to statins. Thank you for your attention. Uh, you're muted, Eugenia. Of course. <laughs> I'm back. Um, so that was a great overview. Thank you. Um, most of us were, many of us were in the room when uh, everyone was clapping for that excellent um, enrollment of women of 48%. Um, so we really do appreciate the effort. I'm wondering on that front, just as we talk about the trial itself, is there anything that, other than encouraging the investigators to enroll highly and to be aware of this, is there anything that you did? Because we need to emulate that. <laughs> well, first of all, we had, we had a couple of advantages. One is there is, a, there is a bit of a female predominance with statin intolerance. More women have the disorder. But having said that, at every investigator meeting and every coordinator call, we said it. And then one more thing, I can't emphasize it enough we found a lot of principal investigators at research sites that were women. And if we want to do this, then we have to empower women as PIs, as local PIs. And 
Going forward, by the way, it's become now our policy in our coordinating center. We want 50% of the executive committees to be women in, our, in the trials that we're doing because it, the time has come for this, this you know, dominance of the white male cardiologist has to end. And I think, I know, I'm sure you agree with me about that, but we worked really hard to find strong women and we found really great women who just needed to be given a chance. Yeah. I do uh, commend you on that because even as a woman who enrolls in clinical trials, I make an effort and it's not easy no, to get that. Easy. So I appreciate it. But you're right, getting the diversity in representation with the uh, investigators, both with respect to race and uh, sex, having that the patients often connect more. Sometimes they're more you know, uh, aware of that. So I think that's wonderful. We also, had 17% Hispanic patients, by the way. Right. Which we also thought was helpful. Yes, definitely, definitely. Um, your uh, follow-up was good as well. Uh, I would say excellent in light of the pandemic that was simultaneously occurring during this time. Um, anything along those lines, just because I know, you know, study retention during that time was extremely challenging. Did you do home labs or home visits for patients as well? Because that is definitely the future, I think, uh, that we need to be looking towards. In, well, you're in great. You're spot on, you know. We went into a scramble. We had weekly calls. We drop ship drugs to people's homes. We sent nurses out to do visits at people's homes. I mean, we just, to, as a team, we stayed on it. And it was very hard. And I worried my way through this trial. And, you know, we just kept at it. And uh, we, we found a lot of creative ways in various countries where we could do different things. You know, we got, we also had very strong uh, national coordinators, by the way, also of whom a lot were women. And our national coordinators knew how to manage the problem in their own country so that there were specific things done in specific countries to help with retention that we, couldn't do in every country, but we didn't as many of them as we could. That's great. Um, and I, I hope that, you know, future trials will continue now that the pandemic is at least for now over to continue to use these strategies because they may even help to keep, you know, more diversity in trials and people who are busy and women who are caretakers to allow them to actually be in these trials. Um, I'd like to ask about the approximately 30% uh, discontinuation of drug in each of the arms of the trial. Um, do you think it's mostly just reflective of the type of patient population that you're dealing with? And then how do you handle those in the trial in terms of intention to treat? Do you think that this um, sort of influenced the results or they would be different if there was greater continuation in the drug? It's actually a pretty high fraction of, uh, of, of adherence. Um, if you look at many of our trials, it's higher. Um, I was also worried about that because these are people who have failed other therapies. And by the way, I'm going to tell you something that I was told by many colleagues around the country. They said, oh, these statin intolerant patients are kind of flaky and whatever you give them, they're not going to tolerate it. And they're not going to stay on bepidoic acid either. The fact that, that and by the way, if you actually calculate the percent of the theoretical exposure that patients got. It's well over 90%. In other words, if you stop a uh, study drug three months before the study ended, you had exposure during most of the treatment period. And so that 15% is how many were off study drug by the end of the trial. But many of them didn't stop until, you know, a few months before the end or maybe a year before the end. So it actually was way above what I expected for adherence. And I think everybody here knows also that adherence to lipid lowering therapies in general isn't very good, you know, in the, in the real world. So right. we were pretty happy with that. Look, okay. if we had kept 100% of the patients on study drug with no crossovers, we would have had a probably a better hazard ratio. But <laughs> right. It would have just worked in your favor, in other words, if we kept yeah, them all. Exactly. That's right. It would have helped us. Yeah. You know, uh, we did the yeah. best that we could. Exactly. 
Exactly. Now, what about the placebo group and the amount of LDL lowering um, noted in that placebo group? Um, approximately 10%. Um, yeah. Do you think that that is all accounted for by these add, uh, add-ins or cross-ins that you got, which is about 6% difference between the two? Um, you know, do you think it was just more LDL lowering? Because we know that uh, bempedoga acid has these other mechanisms as well. Um, how do you explain that aspect? So we're in the process of doing a whole series of secondary analyses. We're going to look at the anti-inflammatory effects very carefully. Um, you know, I, I go back a long way with this hypothesis around inflammation and coronary disease. And, you know, we, ha we don't have all the answers yet. We do have some answers for some of the questions that are being asked some of which we are going to be publishing relatively soon and presenting at major conferences. So, you know, this story isn't over yet. We have a lot more drilling down, you know, you know, the database, if you look at the, the from my statisticians, that when they handed me the data for the trial with all thousand pages of information, I said, this is a gold mine of information in a population we've never really studied this yeah. closely before. And we need to, really help, you know, our colleagues understand what we can learn from this population. Yeah. And I want to get to like comparisons with other trials and everything. But I want to just clarify because there is a few questions in the chat, but I think there's a bit of a misunderstanding of the trial design about why, how is it possible that the providers in the placebo arm weren't more aggressive with lipid threat. Again, this is a blinded trial and you only alerted them if the lipids went up by 25%. And then in those cases, you know, the cross-ends, you know, were just a, a second part of it. But I think, can you just review the design in terms of the blinding and whatnot? Yeah, everybody's blinded. You know, we emphasize it over and over and over again, but here's what happens. You know, Patients go into a cardiology site, they get enrolled. There's a family practitioner that they see as well. The family practitioner cannot resist when they get their annual laboratories checking a lipid panel, seeing something and acting. Thank you. And so the bottom line is that, you know, as much as you do your very, yeah. very best to blind lipids, it's just really hard yeah. when there are multiple physicians yep. involved. In fact, patients can go into a local CVS, you know, our local drugstore, get a finger stick cholesterol and find out themselves. So, so we worked at this, we did our best yep. with it. Uh, I think we did okay. Uh, I would have liked to have, to have seen less drop in, in the placebo group, but you know, that's the nature, human nature. Absolutely. No, thank you for explaining. I think that was a little bit of a uh, just a misunderstanding. The um, the subgroups. So uh, secondary prevention differing from primary prevention so significantly. You know, I, I when I think about the trial, I think about well, you know, the starting LDL is very important. Well, the risk of the patient is very important. The secondary benefits of this medication are very important. So it's very hard, as you said, to reconcile all that. And we'll be interested to see all of your analyses. But how do you explain um, the, the major difference between the primary and secondary prevention arms? We have lost our way here. What has happened is that if you go back, go back to the Jupiter trial, you may remember the Jupiter trial was a high-risk primary prevention trial that showed a 44% reduction in the primary endpoint, was stopped early for overwhelming efficacy, and had a mortality benefit. People forgot about it. Um, HOPE 3 showed a very robust reduction in primary prevention. In recent years, almost all of the LDL lowering trials have studied only secondary prevention. And there's a reason. They wanted to get there quickly. So for the PCSK9 inhibitor trials, they wanted to get the fastest answer they could so that they could be the first on the market with proof of, of efficacy. So they studied only secondary prevention patients because the event rates are higher. If you look back historically, the relative risk reduction in high-risk primary prevention has consistently been larger. And this is a wake-up call because if you look at the literature, 
less than 50% of high-risk primary prevention patients are being treated with an LDL-lowering therapy. A higher fraction of secondary prevention patients are being treated, but we are missing an opportunity. We are going to have more to say about this issue soon. <laughs> and we'll be coming to find you to hear about it. Absolutely. Yes, 100% agree. And I, Jupiter is probably the, the closest one. I mean, I, you know, looking at CTT, there's about a 0.8 hazard ratio for approximately 40% lowering in um, Jupiter is about a 0.77 hazard ratio, 50% lowering, but then you also, you know, have quite a bit of CRP lowering. And then you also show the PCSK9 trials where it's about a, you know, 0.85 hazard ratio. Um, the thing with those though, right, these are patients who are already benefiting from a statin um, and getting tremendous LDL lowering, but comparable, if not maybe even less than, you know, some of these other trials in terms of outcomes reduction. So do you think that um, this CRP, <laughs> the less diabetes, other things are factoring in here? Do you think that the comparisons to the secondary prevention patients is more, is less uh, sort of fair than to the primary prevention? How do you sort of reconcile all that? Well, first of all, the one thing I want to make sure I say is that uh, uh, subgroup analyses are risky. And my friend, Tom Fleming, who's one of the greatest statisticians I've ever known says, let me study enough subgroups and I'll show you anything you want. Mm -hmm. uh, so having said that, we want to be conservative about subgroup analyses, um, but there does appear to be a signal here. And I don't think it's a big surprise. You know, I think we saw that, you know, se you know seven or eight years ago with Hope 3. And I hope for the those that are listening, you don't forget the really robust risk reduction we saw in high risk prior prevention. When a patient comes in, I see this all the time, and I'm going to be, I'm going to probably insult some people, but you know, they come in, they're being managed by uh, endocrinology with for diabetes, and they're on every glucose lowering drug you can imagine, but their LDLs are high and not being treated. And this is a wake up call. LDL reduction in high-risk primary prevention, particularly with diabetes, has an enormous treatment effect, and we must get our colleagues to see that. Absolutely. That's a very, very important message. Um, there's no question in primary prevention it gets missed, and uh, people don't start to think about this until patients show evidence of cardiovascular disease, which is not the correct approach. And, and the other problem is, frankly, our guidelines are just terrible. <laughs> uh, you know, our guidelines, basically, you don't get to a risk level until you get to be old, okay? And so, you know, the fact is, you know, as you, many of you know, I'm not a fan of the pool cohort equations, you know, and I think that this whole concept of letting, uh, making, of having somebody who has a high LDL, but they're not old enough that their risk rises to a level where they, the treatment is recommended, we're going to wait 10 years to treat a disorder. And I think, hope everybody knows, the best predictor of your lifelong risk is your time average LDL over your lifetime. And so I'd rather treat them earlier. And I'm going to use these, this information to help amplify the message, find people with high LDL that have risk factors, don't be a slave to the risk calculator, Use common sense and treat when it makes sense to treat. When you have a drug that costs, like statins do, $3 a month, and if they don't tolerate it, okay, well, then you got a little bit you know, more expensive drug. But the bottom line is find a way to lower LDL yeah. in people when you can still do them some good and still wait until waiting, instead of waiting till they have their MI. Prevent the whole process of plaque buildup that will prevent the MI. Um, and my colleagues are definitely going to have me wrap up here. So I want to ask you just one last question for the group. So right now, going back to their practices, uh, how you, even at this moment, where you see them starting this statin intolerant, add-on therapy, secondary prevention, et cetera, very exciting, um, but help us to uh, guide their, our algorithms. I, I'm going to say it as clearly as I can. Try a statin. If it doesn't work, try another statin. If you get the patients to 
do it, try another statin. And if you get through, you know, if you get to the point where the patient says, I've had enough, I'm not going to take a statin, um, then you've got other options, you know, and one of them is benthodoic acid, the other is a PCSK9 inhibitor. And depending on the level of LDL, the level of risk, this drug will, should play a role somewhere in the armamentarium. Statins remain the cornerstone of therapy. Uh, no one should get the wrong message from this discussion, but there are some people that we all see where we just can't get there with a statin. We can't get them to take a statin. And whether it's the nocebo effect or whether it's a real disorder, doesn't matter. If a patient walks in the office and says, I won't take a statin, we have to have something we can offer to them. You can show them that this is a study with people, where people like you did in fact tolerate an alternative drug. Absolutely. Great yeah, message. Thank you so much. You guys did a great job, Dr. Gianna, Dr. Nissen. I think this is a fabulous talk. It's very timely as we uh, uh, imagine these to be. Uh, I think everybody learned something and hopefully this will spread like wildfire. So there are a lot of intolerant people. And I guess the, the question is these people are left alone, oftentimes left alone. And so there are options now. We have PCSK9. I think there's a lot more data we need about how to compare these two or where do you try first or second. But I thank you both for your time. Dr. Vidilli, you want to close up? Yeah, thank you again, um, Dr. Nissen. Thank you, Dr. Giannos. We really appreciate the very insightful um, discussion. Um, and on the behalf of uh, New York ACC, have a great night. Thank you, and uh, great to see all of you, and uh, hope I'll see you all in person sometime soon. We're back to live meetings, which makes That's me happy. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, everyone.